Hey, Robert Mitchell here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So, what are we doing here today? Today we're going to make a little video called The Essential Warrior Path. Monks, Knights, Jedis, Braves, and Adepts. So, um, this is the backstory. I was assigned uh, some readings on the subject of Rosicrucianism for my seminary. And in the course of reading those books, I read several, uh, most of which I thought were, the two of them which I thought were pretty unremarkable. However, the last one was a book called History and Doctrine of the Rose Claw, and it was by Paul Shadir. Now, what Paul Shadir did was he distilled all that had been written that he could accumulate on the topic of the Rosicrucians. What is Rosicrucianism? So Rosicrucianism was an idea that sprung up in the early 1600s and a couple of uh, tracts or, or short booklets were printed up and handed out and they appeared from nowhere and they were anonymous and they've been tried to be attributed to various famous people over the years but uh, they, uh, they've been described as uh, radically anti-papal They've been described as mystical, alchemical, hermetic, you name it. Uh, many people have tried to take, lay claim to them. Many people have tried to disavow themselves of them. Uh, they are uniformly loved, despised, feared, adored, you name it. But they have, whatever they have been called, they're certainly not boring. In any event, uh, he distilled everything together about the um, history and doctrine of the Rose Claw, uh, both fictional and non-fictional, and he had read everything. He was, uh, who was Paul Shadir? He lived from 1871 through 1926. He was French, and he early in life was interested in the occult and uh, the esoteric. Later in life, he became uh, an, a, a Christian, an esoteric Christian, and he devoted himself to the pursuit of the Christian life. So, in the course of reading Paul's book, um, Shadir, Paul Shadir's book, at the very end he has a list of things he calls the secret signs of the adept. What is an adept? Adult, an adept is, in the Rosicrucian concept, an adept who is one step short of the Master, Christ himself. He is the, the ultimate human being. And the secret signs of the adept, there are 16 of them, and he, and he says, this is how you can identify the adept. And so I read these 16 things, and when I read them, I thought, those sound like warrior precepts. I'm, I've been doing martial arts for over 30 years. I've studied a number of martial arts. And they sounded like martial ideas, martial concepts. And that got me to thinking. So I'm sharing this with you now. So he says, A rose qua is patient, good, doesn't know envy, doesn't hurry, isn't vain, isn't untidy, isn't ambitious, isn't irritable, doesn't think ill of others, loves justice, loves truth, knows how to be silent, believes what he knows, his hope is steadfast. He has no cravings. And he remains a re member of the society forever. So, I really, those really got to me, and I, don't, I couldn't put my finger on why. And so I decided to undertake a study. And I began to think, I thought, well, this sounds like a list of warrior attributes. And then I thought, well, what are the core warrior attributes? And then how would I arrive at them? So what I did was I identified eight different spiritual warrior types and groups. And then I decided to distill everything that I could about those warrior types and put them in a database. And then I would find out which attributes were common to every warrior type, if any, which made them unique. And then I'd arrive at hopefully a dozen is what I was looking for. And it turned out that there were exactly a dozen that were, that were present in at least half of the eight warrior types. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because I don't want this video to be a six-hour video series. 
but I'm going to walk you through a little bit of my analysis and talk a little bit about each of the eight warrior types. And then I'm going to tell you what makes each one unique, and I'm going to tell you what the, dis the distilled list is of 12. So, walk with me now down eight different paths of the spiritual warrior. Hey, all right. So, now I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the underlying philosophies of the different warrior types. I'm going to have to gloss over them a little bit just because they're so complex that that this video would be really long and I'm trying to get this thing down to maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. So we're going to go pretty quickly. Now, if you're interested in more detail, I'm going to scan up my notes and they're going to be on my Patreon. So if you want to get access to the notes that went into this, uh, that I prepared for this, then you'll, uh, and they're unvarnished. I don't polish my stuff. Uh, I don't sit there and try to be all perfect and, um, try to make believe things. I just print them up. So I'll put this, excuse me, on Patreon and then it's a dollar. So all you have to do is pledge a dollar a month to my uh, Patreon and you can get access to everything. Um, I'm going to do this at the lowest possible tier so that any dollar uh, you can get it. All right, so what are the, uh, the first of the eight that I decided to analyze and put into my database was Cabal Fang. So what is Cabal Fang? Cabal Fang is the martial art that I founded. I'm trying to find a copy of the Cabal Fang manual. It's around here somewhere. Uh, I'm in the middle of rewriting it. Uh, rewriting's been going on for forever, but uh, here's my dog-eared copy um, that I've carried around forever working on. Um, but uh, the... Uh, Cabal Fang is the martial art that I founded in, in about 2009. It's completely free. Uh, you, if you've been watching my channel, you know that you can enroll in the Hermit Path Distance Learning Program absolutely free. We are a 501c3 federally recognized um, nonprofit. So Cabal Fang was founded because I, 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 it frustrated me that there was there was no spiritual or character development really that was at the forefront of any of the modern martial arts and I wanted to see someone marry together modern effective martial arts practice with spiritual progress uh, spiritual teaching so that's what Cabal Fang is now the precepts the ideas that went into the database for Cabal Fang were of course the five vital graces of Cabal Fang which are wonder, sagacity, frugality, indomitability, and fraternity. Now, what are those? So, wonder is looking at the world with a sense of wonder and excitement and anticipation and an idea of that feeling that you get when you just can't believe how amazing the world is because the world is amazing. Just think of it this way. This whole universe could be dead. It was once dead, and now it isn't. So imagine what it would be like if everything was just dead rocks with no life and no plants and no wind and no stars. Sagacity. That's worldly wisdom. So that's understanding the ways of the world, how the world works. Okay? Worldly wisdom. Frugality, that's, that is resourceful and not wasting of resources. And that's all types of resources. Monetary, 
attention resources, okay? Endowment ability literally means not subdued, not able to be tamed, untamable, unstoppable. And then fraternity, which of course is the um, faithfulness among a band of brothers and sisters. Okay. Then we have the six lightnings of Saint Barakiel. Uh, 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 Archangel Barakiel is uh, also known as Saint Barakiel in some Christian uh, denominations. Um, the six lightnings are six um, pieces of advice that uh, we use in Cabal Fang. And those are, keep only what is valuable, move gracefully through the world, plan but don't procrastinate, go ever forward, share everything, save your weapons, and live with intent and purpose. Okay? What is the central theme? My laptop is firing up by itself. That's interesting. Uh, let's shut that. Um, what is the central theme of Cabal Fang? Well, it begins with acknowledging your higher power. And then it hinges on integrity, which is the unification of your thoughts, desires, actions, and beliefs. And regular practice of the four disciplines, uh, or the quadriga, which are meditation, contemplation, prayer, and divine reading, or reading of sacred literature, okay? And then, really centrally, and this was the first thing that was built into Cabal Fang from the beginning, and you might even say it's the central tenet, and that is fitness, physical fitness. Um, that is to say, we have two constitutionals. You have to do two. We, have, we, have, we set a constitutional at the beginning of each month, and you have to do it twice a week. If you don't do two constitutionals a week, you're not practicing Cabal Fang. That's very central. And so I'm going to save the 12 uh, maxims, the 12 tenets that I distilled from all eight martial arts that I analyzed for the end. And I'm going to do that because I want to keep your attention mainly, but I'm going to reveal the what makes each one unique. And so what makes, uh, as, as we go along, I'm going to reveal what makes them unique. So what makes... Cabal Fang, unique among all the eight uh, warrior monk styles that I studied, is uh, or two things, sagacity and fitness. So I'm sure other martial arts have talked about uh, uh, spiritual warrior paths, mentioned being wise in the ways of the world at some point, but it's not a primary focus. In Cabal Fang, it is. Also, fitness. Fitness seems to be just sort of assumed in all the other martial arts, but in Cabal Fang, it's actually central. And we think of it like wringing out a rag. You have to squeeze that sweat out, and it purifies the uh, mind, body, and spirit. So, that's the first one that I put into the database. Next to go into the database were the Huarong. Now, the Huarong were the uh, flowering knights, they were called, of Korea. And these uh, flowering knights uh, were of the Silla kingdom. And the, the, so the, the uh, Silla kingdom unified all of Korea, all the warring uh, factions together. And it was an unheard of period of um, uh, peace and plenty in the country. And... Every martial art of Korea really um, draws on their tenets and their ideas for their martial arts. And I, you know, of the Korean martial arts that I have studied and read about and actually practiced, my, my first black belt was in Taekwondo. Um, it had originally been called uh, Dong Sudo, and it was an old school. Korean karate, really, is what it was. 
Uh, but he, he moved, my instructor moved in more into Taekwondo because it was the popular name that everyone liked, but really it was old school. Um, but he traced the lineage of Taekwondo back to the Huarong. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the, on the Huarong warriors over the years. I've read a number of books about the Huarong. Um, I even wrote a paper for about the uh, Knights of Silla or Sira and their poetry. They wrote poetry in several different forms. They wrote Sijo poetry and they wrote Hyanja poetry. These are forms sort of like haiku. And you could go down a rabbit hole and spend your whole life. Anyway, I wrote a series of, a series of I wrote a paper and some articles about it. And then uh, I spoke to a man locally named Kijiang Jian, and he helped me translate some things. And I got on the radar of the coach of the uh, National uh, Olympic Taekwondo team out in California, and I got an invite to go to the Olympics, which I wasn't able to go, and all that stuff. So anyway, suffice to say, my background in these guys is pretty, uh, pretty complete. So... The Huarong warriors trained in three primary areas, self-defense, self-confidence, and self-control. Uh, they were nobles. They were all young nobles, and as a consequence, there were five primary things that were expected of them. They were expected to be elegant in their manners. They were supposed to be exemplary in their conduct, impeccable in their appearance, cultured in every possible way, and they were expected to be spiritually accomplished and educated. The five tenets of the Huarong. Loyalty to one's Lord. Love and respect of parents. Trust among friends. There's that, there's that um, fraternity thing again. Never retreat in battle. And never take a life without just cause. Uh, incidentally, you may not think you know much about the Huarong, but if you've ever played the video game Tekken, there's a character in there named Huarong. Um, uh, fun fact, he's my favorite character in the Tekken video game series. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he's the mad kicker that if, that if you get the version, that uh, one of the later versions, he has the spurs on his feet and the, and the boots and the chaps, which that just, you know... As a fan of frontier martial arts, to have the two things wedded together and have a guy that does uh, uh, has the Korean kicks with boots and spurs, how does it get any better than that? In any event, um, the five tenets, I'm sorry, I got lost. I got so excited, I want to just put this down and go play Tekken. Um, loyalty to five tenets of the Huarong, loyalty to one's lord, love and respect of parents, trust among friends, never retreat in battle, and never take a life without just cause. Now, the ten tenets of Taekwondo, which emerge out of uh, the Huarong, are be loyal to your country, be obedient to your parents, respect and love your spouse, be cooperative with brothers and sisters, respect your elders, be faithful to your teacher, be faithful to your friends. Use good judgment before killing any living thing. Never retreat in battle and always finish what you start. Um, I mentioned the poetry, and I wanted to share this one poetry poem because it's really exemplary, and it's about one of the knights of Sira. This is um, Knight Kippa, uh, Kip Kipparong. O oh, tonight, Kippa. The moon that pushes her way through the thickets of clouds, is she not pursuing the white clouds? Night Kippa once stood by the water, reflecting his face in the iro. Henceforth I shall seek and gather among pebbles the depth of his mind. Night you are the towering pine that scorns frost, ignores snow. And so the pine being the symbol of immortality, 
he the knight symbolizes the immortality of his beliefs and tenets and strength which stand as a monument to all who follow so um kind of gives you chills so what makes the warong unique among the eight that i studied the, the appearance thing it's very unusual so they they painted their faces in the traditional way um they um so and they were expected to be impeccable in their appearance i thought that was really interesting and quite unique among the other warriors um and then obedience to parents so obviously this is all very big in the korean culture itself uh and you often see this in uh, other cult asian cultures and so the whole movie uh, crazy rich asians is about obedience to parents and and obedience to the traditional ways and so on so this this crops up repeatedly in a number of asian cultures and it's um uh, well, it appears in Western culture, too. It's just not as much in the forefront as it once was. Um, now, what is the spiritual underpinning of the Huarong? So, uh, their um, tenets were sort of Neo-Confucian. They had three primary influences. Um, Mahayana Buddhism. Taoism and then Neo-Confucianism were the three main influences. And you can see that because they are, Korea was the stomping ground. So everyone was crisscrossing, crushing Korea and causing problems. You know, you had Chinese influences, you had Japanese influences, and you had indigenous things. And so that's why you have such a crazy um sort of marriage of lots of different types of philosophies. So the next set of spiritual warriors that I analyzed, that I put into the database, were the monks of Shaolin. The Shaolin monks are near and dear to my heart. And what got me into martial arts in the first place, bear with me a second. What got me into martial arts in the first place was the TV show Kung Fu, which I own the entire thing on DVD because, yeah, that's how I roll. And as a kid in the 70s who was obsessed with, uh, with martial arts and um, not doing them, watching them, I didn't do them until I got, until I got uh, much older and I could afford to do it because we were really poor back then and couldn't afford martial arts. Uh, um, it stuck with me. It really, it really stuck with me, that show. And whereas the show's not super realistic uh, and, and um, far from being a documentary by any stretch of the imagination, it did spur me on to read quite a bit about the monks of Shaolin. Now, I never, to be frank, I never studied Kung Fu. Um... You know, I had the pleasure of talking with and chatting with and hanging out with and on occasion sparring with some guys that did Kung Fu. But I never actually practiced Kung Fu. Uh, Shaolin form or any other form for that matter. But the underpinnings of Shaolin is basically what it is, is it's fighting skills married with Chan Buddhism. Um... And so Chan Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and the Four Exertions and so on that are prevalent in um, that Buddhist, Chan Buddhist path. So I put into there the following concepts into my database. The Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. You know, birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Illness is suffering. Everything is suffering. And, um, you know, trying to, trying to deal with that suffering is in itself suffering and there's no escape from it. The origin of suffering is craving. So being denied the thing that you want or you think that, thing that you think you have. So when you're aging, you desire youth and not having it is suffering. When you are ill, then you crave health, which is also suffering. So if you can get away from 
craving, then you can alleviate suffering. That's called cessation, and that's the third of the four noble truths. Giving up on craving and not being reliant upon it is cessation, freedom from suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path itself, which is the right view, the right intention, the right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And those ideas, the right view, um, our actions have consequences, death is not the end uh, of our existence, our actions and beliefs have consequences after our death, that gets us into karma, and all those sorts of things. Um, number two on the Eightfold Path, the right resolve or intention. So, giving up on the things, uh, the conventional way, uh, uh, life ways of the typical family life, uh, life a family life, business, a home, and all of that, and then living the life of a religious um, pilgrim, if you will, just like, like Kung Fu, if you ever saw the TV series, just wandering about the world, or like at the end of Pulp Fiction, when um, Samuel L. Jackson's character says, I'm going to walk the earth, like that Kung Fu in that one TV series, right? The right speech, so no lying, no rude speech, no telling, no um, uh, gossiping, and all that sort of thing. Right conduct and, and right action, so no killing, no maiming, no injury, uh, no stealing, um, no material desires, um, no sex. That's it's chastity too as well. Number five, right livelihood. So only possessing the bare minimum to stave off death itself. Uh, begging to feed oneself. You, you just the bare minimum required to sustain life. Seven, the right mindfulness. So. Um, being mindful of the teachings that are beneficial to the path. And so, you know, just bear attention. So paying attention to only the things that are on the path itself. And then number eight, right samadhi, which is practicing the four stages of meditation uh, reinforcement, equanimity, and so on. Uh, equa equanimity, rather. Equanimity is the, the idea that it doesn't matter what's going on with you, you're the same person. So it doesn't matter if you're sick or in pain or stressed or whatever else, then you are the same person at all times. Okay? Uh, and then finally, the four exertions. Um, and these are the things that you're supposed to be spending your effort on if you're practicing Chan Buddhism. Restraint of the senses. Abandonment of defilements, such as anxiety, fear, anger, and desire. Uh, cultivation of enlightenment factors. All the things we talked about before. Mindfulness, energy, joy, relaxation, concentration, etc. And then finally, preservation. Uh, that, is, that is maintaining concentration and meditating on death. Now, this is going to come up again in other warrior paths, the contemplation of death. So the thing that I thought was fascinating that came out through this is what makes the Shaolin monk unique among the eight warrior paths is relaxation. So uh, obviously you have to be relaxed. You, you can't be, you can't fight if you're tense. And that comes out in all of the martial arts. It comes out in, uh, you know, the Japanese martial arts. I was going to pull out a book, but I'll pull out a couple of books when we get to some, uh, some of the other martial arts um, in the next section, in fact. But, um, 
The Shaolin were the only ones that front load relaxation, as relaxation and tranquility especially as being essential to their, their way of doing things. Uh, anyone who's fought knows that you can't go into the fight tense. You have to be loose, you have to be relaxed. But it's not just about the fight for the Shaolin, it's about life. It's about the way that you, the way that you carry yourself in the world in a relaxed way. So the next uh, spiritual warrior path that I put in my database was the samurai. This is perhaps the one I know the most about, aside from the Huarong. These are covered in a lot of great books. Uh, Living the Martial Way by Force Morgan. For my money, probably the best manual for warrior thinking and warrior process I've ever read. Um, modern book about that. Uh, Hagakuri, which is absolutely fantastic. If you haven't seen the movie Ghost Dog, The Way of the Samurai, directed by Jim Jarmusch, it's a modern film about a modern warrior who wraps himself around this up in this book. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, Musashi's Book of Five Rings. Um, and somewhere in here, um, I don't know what, what happened to it. I might have might have loaned it out, but obviously, uh, Karate Do, My Way of Life by Gichin Funakoshi, the founder of karate, which has its feet firmly planted in the way of the samurai. So um, there are a lot of great sources for samurai wisdom and precepts. Some of the ones that I used, I just listed. Um, but um, you can find some of them online. The Kashoki, um, the 21 Precepts of Dokodo, all of those are in this document, which is going to be on my Patreon. Uh, go donate a dollar a month and follow me on Patreon and you can get access to this document. Uh, but uh, I'll just quote a couple things. So, Yamamoto Sunetomo summarized the uh, way of the samurai as follows. Meditation on inevitable death should be performed daily. Each day when one's mind and body are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, rifles, spears, and swords, being thrown into the midst of a great fire, being carried away by surging waves, being struck by lightning, falling from thousand-foot cliffs, dying for disease, or committing seppuku at the death of one's master. And each day without fail, one should consider himself as dead. This is the way of the samurai. And so when I read that in the book of the samurai, um, the Hagakori, which means uh, hidden leaves or hidden by leaves, I had to memorize it. I mean, it was just, it, there was no way I could not memorize it. It just had to be done. Um, so, um, interestingly, the samurai, his spiritual foundation is in Zen. Zen Buddhism is what Chan Buddhism became in its migration to China, from, uh, from China to Japan. So, there is a certain similarity between Zen and Chan. So, you're going to see Although the martial style is quite different, you see some similarities between the Zen Buddhists, uh, the, between the, the philosophy of the samurai and the philosophy of the Shaolin. Um, but, but there's a hardness in the uh, samurai that's different than the relaxation. Relaxation is certainly not something that you associate with samurai. So the essence of Bushido, as defined by uh, Saito Chikamori, is as follows. Sincerity. Do not lie or be insincere or, or be superficial. Responsibility. Frugality. Politeness. Modesty. Loyalty. Harmony. 
tranquility, and compassion. Now, harmony, I did not list, is going to be the what makes one of the other martial, uh, spiritual martial paths unique. And I didn't, because harmony doesn't mean in the samurai code the same thing that it means. They list it as harmony, but if you read the definition, they say harmony is to be on good terms with comrades. So that's actually not harmony in the sense that we understand harmony, world harmony, harmony in, you know, the culture, but harmony amongst the group. So it's actually fraternity, right? Um, later on, the Bushido developed um, during the Meiji period. Uh, Natobi Inazo developed a list of what he considered the eight um, the eight characteristics that a samurai should have in their code, in their daily behavior. Acute honesty, righteousness, acute honesty and integrity, heroic courage, benevolence and compassion, respect for others, honesty, again, honor, it just keeps coming up, honor, 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 duty and loyalty, and self-control. Now, as you learn in this book, when they say honor, you have to be very cautious about what that means to a samurai. So, to a samurai, honor is not the appearance. In other words, it's not saving face and putting on a fake front. Only you can besmirch your honor, right? So, when you see a tattoo that says death before dishonor, that's not what it's talking about. Honor is fulfilling obligations without regard for your personal needs. And that's what the samurai is all about. So, he fulfills his duty and his obligations regardless of what his wants and his needs are. And one of the things that's common to the samurai is the idea that, the idea that um, um, if you... If you think about things too much, sooner or later, you'll think them around to your own benefit. So, um, you don't, a, a samurai doesn't think too much. All decisions should be able to be made, regardless of their import, any decision should be capable of being made in the span of seven breaths to a samurai. And then I won't list all 21 precepts of the of Dakodo but they'll be in the document if you want to get them. So what makes the samurai unique is the focus on politeness and sincerity. So um, being sincere sort of appears in other places. Obviously, it's a human, a human um, absolute that people value sincerity, right? But again, we're not talking about we're talking about the, the thrust that's on the forefront of what these spiritual warriors are talking about. So that's kind of cool. Politeness and sincerity. Politeness is big in Japanese culture. My son tells, tells me he's, he's obviously fluent in Japanese and knows all about it. Um, but he says that there's, there's a million ways to say thank you because that politeness is at the center of Japanese culture, period. So that's interesting. So anyway, moving on. The next spiritual warrior path that I put into my database were um, the knight, European Knights, especially the Knights Templar. Um, now, they, uh, I have always been fascinated by that. Uh, those people who know me know that when I was in college and I studied English, I had thought about uh, getting, going forward and getting a master's. I only got an undergraduate degree. Had I moved on, I would have been pursuing uh, special. My specialization would have been in Arthurian literature. I'm obsessed with it, and I've read so many versions of the King Arthur story you can't even imagine. Um, but um, especially Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I have read that through and through, and I've read books about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, I'm obsessed with that as a description of the ideal knight. And so I'll share this with you from the description of Gowan, 
uh, Sir Gawain. People often think that's Gawain. It's not Sir Gawain. It's Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain from um, the um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Gawain was faithful in five and fivefold. For pure he was as gold, void of all villainy, and endowed with all virtues. Therefore he bare the pentangle on shield and surcoat as truest of heroes and gentlest of knights. The five-pointed star with the interwoven pieces that go in and out was a Christian symbol. It has become associated with Wicca these days and the occult and so on, but it initially was a symbol of the five wounds of Christ. It was a Christian symbol, and it's been co-opted. For he was faultless in his five senses, and his five fingers never failed him. And his trust upon earth was in the five wounds of Christ that bear in the five wounds that Christ bear on the cross, as the creed tells. And wherever this knight found himself in stress of battle, he deemed well that he drew his strength from the five joys of which the Queen of Heaven had of her child. And for this cause did he bear an image of Our Lady on the one half of his shield, the inner half of his shield, that whenever he looked upon it, he might not lack for aid. And the fifth five that the hero used were frankness and fellowship above all, purity and courtesy that never failed him, and compassion that surpasses all. And in these five virtues was that hero wrapped and clothed. Okay? Now, five comes up a lot. And so, the warrior uh, in, in Cabal Fang, we have the five vital graces. He has the five, these things here. The five, uh, five is central to this. Five comes up a lot, and you'll see it in this document if you look it up. So, um, he is observant but not led astray. He's faultless in his five senses. Uh, he's strong and possessed of fighting prowess. Five fingers never failed him. Um, Christ is his Savior. He trusts in the five wounds of Christ, the five joys, joys of Mary. These are the joyful mysteries of the rosary. The five joys of Mary from the joyful mysteries. The Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, the Presentation of Jesus in the Temple, and, of course, the finding of Jesus in the temple later on. Um, maybe they meant, well, I guess maybe you could think of those, though, as the Annunciation, the Nativity, the Adoration of the Magi, the Resurrection of Christ, and the Ascension of Christ to Heaven. But, anyway, whichever five you like, and then finally, frankness, fellowship, purity, courtesy, and compassion. Now, um, there are later on Ten Commandments of Chivalry that are developed by a guy named Gautier, but those are discredited, and they're later on they're really not all that uh, reliable that we would use those, but I listed them here anyway just for anyone who's interested. Now, what's really interesting in the Knights Templar, so much has been written about the Knights Templar. A lot of it fictionalized from all the way from um, that book we won't talk about, uh, Holy, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, all the way through Dan Brown and all of his books. Um, now, I didn't rely upon any of that silly fiction about Knights Templar. I relied upon the rule of Rome or rather the Latin rule. The Latin rule was a document with 72 clauses that was, has been attributed to Bernard de Clairvaux and Hugh de Payen. It is also known as the specific behavior of the Templar order, and it outlines the ideal behavior of a knight. Um, it borrows a lot from the rule of St. Augustine, but it was mostly inspired by the rule of St. Benedict. It was written in 1128, and um, we can reasonably attest that it was actually used by knights as a code of behavior. It's way too long to read here, 
but I will read you the highlights that I identified that I put into the database. Renunciation of worldly desires, courage in battle, regular prayer, silence, speaking only when necessary, no idle chatter, no wisecracking, no provocation of laughter. Uh, the quote that just really stuck with me from these guys was, Every idle word contains a sin. Wow. So these guys were true warrior monks. So these are knights who don't say diddly. The common life, sharing everything, tithing. The tenth part of their food was to be given to the poor. Period. Simple clothing and accoutrements. In other words, they were not allowed to wear, they were they must be worn all clothes all of one color. So they could wear all white, all black, or all brown. That's it. Um, their clothes had to be simple enough that they had they could be taken off and put on by themselves. In other words, no fancy clothes so that you'd have to have a a page or a footman or somebody to help you get dressed or a, a butler or something to help you get dressed. No fancy buckles, no fancy shoes, no embellishments on shields, no fancy arms or armor, and no fancy horses. They were only allowed to use the standard arms and armor provided to them by the master of the order that they were in. They weren't even allowed to have a fancy feed bag for their horse. They were allowed only one mattress, one pillow, and one cloak. That's it. They were to be humble clean, obedient to their sub their superiors to a fault. They were allowed to have to be to have poverty. Even the bag for their coin could have no latch. It had to be open, symbolizing that if someone wanted to reach in and take it, that was just fine. Think about that for a minute. They were not allowed to hunt recreationally, so they weren't allowed to take any pleasure in the hunting of game. They were not allowed to have female companions. They were required to care for the support and care of the sick um, members of the order uh, in, their, in their aged, when they were old and sick. Um, they were admonished to shun strife, envy, malice, murmurings, mutterings, and slanders. They were advised to flee from them as if from the plague. I love that. Complete and utter chastity. No kissing of women, not even female relatives. They were not even allowed to gaze at the face of a woman. That's pretty intense. And they were not even allowed to be a godfather to a child because that child would be placed before the needs of the order. Um... What made the Templar order unique? Well, um, I picked, I said obedience. Now, obedience is necessary in any military group, but the extreme obedience that they had to practice was off the chain. And their silence. No one else talks like they do principally many, many times over and over again about keeping your mouth shut. Very, very important to the Templar Knights. Um, and just full disclosure, I'm a member of a Templar Order. It's an honorary membership that I was given. And I, I'm not active in the group. I've often thought about becoming more active in the Templar group, but I uh, sometimes go and join in with the group, but full disclosure, I am a member of a Templar order. So uh, anyway, so then the next one that I went to was Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics. Now, when you think of Stoics, you don't think of a warrior path, and there aren't really any existing warrior, warrior Stoics. But I included them here just because it's such a big, big influence in the Western world on the idea of the warrior path. Uh, nowadays, the Stoicism is very popular amongst um, 
guys like um, uh, Jocko Willink and um, what's the guy's name? Mark Devine, eight weeks to seal fit, these guys. And so, um, and then Marcus Aurelius was a general, a Roman general, who then went on to write his, his famous uh, meditations. So I felt like I had to include the Stoics in this. Uh, I don't know a great deal about the Stoics, so I just, I'll be frank, I just went and I found a couple of um, condensed sayings of Marcus Aurelius. I have read a lot of the meditations. Uh, I reviewed the meditations and I came up with some basic ideas. Um, um, Virtue alone is sufficient for happiness. Virtue is at the top of this for the Stoics. And virtue consists in a will that is in agreement with nature. So the Sto what, is that, what that means is whatever time brings it to me is as refreshing as, as the taste of refreshing, is as refreshing as the taste of fruit, right? So is one of his quotes. Um, Whatever time brings it to me is, yeah. So he is focused on accepting what is, or as the um, Hindus call suchness is the same idea. So to be free from anger, envy, and jealousy, and to accept even slaves as the equal of other men, because all men alike are products of nature. So virtue, self-control, fortitude, Reason and logic, agreement with nature, emotional detachment, again, equality, pantheism, and equanimity. So, in other words, being the same person all the time. And this is, again, something that's that you find often in the warrior path. Now, what makes the Stoic ethic unique amongst all the warrior paths that I put in my database was reason and logic. So there's a focus here in the Stoics on the autonomous, the completely autonomous individual will toward thinking with logical detachment and not being wrapped up in emotions. And they liken it to being dragged along by a cart, a uh, dog cart. You're a cart dragged by a dog through the street if you're being led around by your emotions. All right? Like a dog tied to a cart and compelled to go wherever it goes. All right? So, uh, in the words of Epictetus, I love this, sick and yet happy, in peril and yet happy, dying and yet happy, in exile and happy, in disgrace and happy. So always that way. And of course, the four platonic um, virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, uh, which then feed into the Christian virtues, and that's a whole other story. The Stoics had a great influence on Christianity and Christian virtues. Now, The next one that I put into my database were the Powhatan Braves, Powhatan Warriors. Now, this is something that we've got to get our heads around. So, you can't just talk about Native American spirituality or Native American warriors. When the colonists came to North America, there were over 900 languages being spoken here. These are distinct cultures. You cannot, you cannot speak uniformly about Native American spirituality or Native American language or Native American anything. You can say Native Americans the same way that you say Asians or uh, Northern Europeans, let's say. That's about all you can say. But they're quite different. They are, well, quite different isn't even fair. They're absolutely unique. 
So I picked Pal the Palatan because I'm reading about them and I'm studying them. So I'm studying their language. This is a book about their language. I'm compiling. This is my uh, studies in the Palatan language book that I'm that I'm using day to day to learn their language. I give myself a daily Palatan quiz. Um, here's a book, The Palatine Indians of Virginia and Their Traditional Culture, which I've read through twice now. Copious notes are in it. So I'm going to speak specifically about the Palatine because I know them. Now, why are they spiritual, though? Were they spiritual warriors? Do they belong in this list? And um, it's hard to know a lot about them. But one thing that we do know is they had something called the Huskanal. The Huskanal was an initiation of young boys into men. They were set apart in a camp. The boys were set apart in the camp for weeks, and after which they emerged as men. Um, what happened was is that uh, there was a ceremony at the beginning where they were ritually, ritually rescued in a sort of a reality play by shamans and then there's a gauntlet of sticks and the shamans take them through the rescue the boys through this gauntlet of men with sticks and it appears they were actually hitting too though they weren't actually playing and they they rescue the boys and then the boys ritually die and then they are taken into the woods and held in cages um some reports say that the training lasted weeks others say it only lasted months that it did last for months. Um, but some reports say that deaths were common. Others say that deaths were uncommon. It's important to remember that basically the Palatan, the, the Palatan um, were virtually eradicated by, by 1700. I mean, it, 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 the, the, um, so it's hard to know a great deal about them. We have limited sources. We have, um, um, the works of John Smith and Strachey and a few others, but really don't have a lot to rely upon. But what we do know is that they were kept naked in these cages for a long period of time, and they were exposed to the weather, and they were given an intoxicating potion called Wicasan uh, or Wisakan. Um, it was probably hallucinogenic. And they weren't allowed to. Uh, they weren't. weren't they, they, they weren't allowed to be just talked to. They weren't. They didn't have conversations with them. Uh, and then eventually they were allowed to be released from the cages, and they were brought back. And then some of the boys were supposedly so detached that they had to be retaught how to speak and how to behave in polite society. They were almost zombie-like in their behavior. This was to breed extreme stoicism into them as warriors. Now, this is distasteful to know, but we have to understand this, that in the Palatan culture, um, that, and, that torture was the norm. Execution by slow torture awaited almost every captive of the Palatan. The procedure started with a prisoner being staked out before a fire. Women, uh, or sometimes a warrior, was assigned the task, and they went to work on the captive who was staked out with sharpened shells, seashells. And they scraped the flesh away down to the bone, bit by bit, throwing it into the fire while the victim watched. And then, slowly, the extremities were removed, and um, finally, they were disemboweled and killed. Now, here's the thing. If at any time the victim cried out in pain, then they were, they, their whole tribe would be forever taunted mercilessly for their failure to remain silent through the um, punishment. So, um, the first time that one of the colonists was captured and tortured in this way, then the Palatan would forever taunt them whenever they felt like it, and they made up songs, taunting, jeering songs, to tease them about the fact that they cried like babies, 
the first time the shell hit the flesh. Um, so, if that's what awaits you and the disgrace of your entire tribe, then these guys were probably uh, virtually immune to pain. The other thing we know about them was that they took a daily cold bath, even the children, even the babies. So they each morning they went to the nearest running stream and they would take a bath in the stream and they did this 12 months a year. Mothers routinely gave their children, their young boys, an archery task before breakfast. If they missed the target, they didn't eat. You don't hit the target, you don't eat. So they would throw up a piece of moss or something, and then they were expected to shoot and hit it. And if they didn't, then there was no breakfast for you. So this is an intense culture here. Um, now, I would say that severe stoicism, extreme pride, reckless courage, unflinching ruthlessness, and supernatural stealth were the mark of the Powhatan warrior. And then stealth is really the one that makes them unique. And this stealthiness is hardcore. So I've got some quotes here that I printed out that um, from uh, Strachey that you might enjoy and benefit from, okay? Suspicions have bred, and bear in mind, this is uh, uh, early 17th century language here. Suspicions have bred strange fears among them, and those fears create strange constructions, and those constructions therefore beget strong watch and guard, especially about their great king, who thrusts forth trusty scouts and careful sentinels, as before mentioned, which reach even from his own court down almost to our palisade gates, which answer one another duly. So these guys are sneaking around, watching everything, and reporting back from one another back to Palatan. Many things, whilst they observe us, are suffered to be amiss among themselves. So in other words, they, they were so busy watching others, sometimes there were things going on in their own kingdom they weren't aware of. They were so vigilant. So, constantly watching, very observant. Now, their disguise, it mentions disguise often. Now, this is a segment about a battle, and you'll notice some things in this. Having painted and disguised themselves in the fairest manner they could devise, they divided themselves into two companies. So they would put one company in the front that the enemy could see, and they have one in the rear that was invisible and could not be seen. And so then they would make a frontal assault and then pull back and then have the other crew pursue them into the midst of the ones that were hidden so that then they could leap out and butcher them. Um, let's see. Um, Upon the first flight of arrows they gave such horrible shouts and screeches as so many infernal hellhounds. And when they had spent their arrows, they joined together prettily, charging and retiring every rank, seconding another. So going in and coming out and going in and coming out, in, out, in, out, in, out. As they get advantage, they catch their enemies by the hair of their head, and down he came that, has, that was taken, his enemy with a wooden sword, and he means those wooden war clubs, right? And so, um, 
So they disperse themselves amongst them and hide. It's really pretty intense. So you can read about it in here. So I would say the well, hold on, there was one quote I wanted to put in here. Um, All their actions, voices, and gestures, both in charging and retiring, were so strained to the height of their quality and nature that the strangeness thereof made it seem very delightful. So in other words, their grace and their coordination, their, their use of voice and their body mechanics and how they moved was mesmerizing to this author. And so... These guys aspired to the, in combat to the highest skill in their actions, in their voices, and in their demeanor. They never cry out in pain. They are inured to the elements. And they break no fast before they train. Uh, and what makes them unique is their stealth. Now, the eighth and final... Um, and, and uh, a lot of this is in my Frontier Martial Arts program. That's not free. You can enroll in that at Mitch.store. It's $19.95 a month. And you can year, learn Frontier Martial Arts, which Frontier Martial Arts is the indigenous um, fighting methods and life ways of the colonists and the indigenous people of uh, North America from, from uh, 1607 through 1912. Uh, also, modern skills. So, uh, 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 survival skills. All right. So, um, the final, the eighth and final warrior path that I'm going to talk about and that I put into my database were the Jedi. Now, the Jedi are fictional. Why would I include them with non-fictional uh, knights, uh, warrior, um, spiritual warriors? Because they're the most famous spiritual warrior of in fiction and because they're certainly certainly the most popular fictional spiritual warrior path um, and there's actually people who have declared them a religion so you can go online you can go to temple of the jedi and uh, the temple of the jedi order website they are a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit corporation and their religion is based on the observance of the Force, which is a ubiquitous and metaphysical power that believe, that Jedi believe to underlie the fundamental nature of the universe. And so um, they, they, they point out that they do not worship George Lucas or the movies, that they believe that Jediism is not based in fiction, but they accept the myth as a practical means of conveying the philosophy to, uh, in its application in real life. So, George Lucas got this. Uh, George Lucas is a Christian. Uh, he has an interest in mythology, and he draws upon Joseph Campbell, Jungian archetypes, uh, Eastern religions, and more. And he once said in an interview with Bill Moyers, I put the force into the movie in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. More a belief in God than a belief in any particular religious system. I wanted to make it so that young people would begin to ask questions about the mystery. And immediately, for someone like me, uh, who is an independent Catholic, uh, I think of the sacred mysteries. So, um, it should come as a shock to no one that the Jedi have five tenets. And if you look at the Temple of the Jedi, their symbol is a five-pointed star. So it calls right back to Gowan and right back to the five vital graces of Cabal Fang. Five, 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 five. It's always five. So here are the five tenets of the uh, Jedi. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death, 
there is the force. So here we begin to see that if I'm like, what I'm saying is, maybe I wasn't complete, so let me just sort of back up and say this. I'm including the Jedi here because he was trying when he created the Jedi to do what I am doing, which is synthesize the greatest spiritual warrior concepts into his fictional ideal. So it comes as no surprise that when I did my database analysis, the Jedi contained more of the, uh, in the database, they contained more of the spiritual ideals of the maxims than any other group because they are in fact a synthesis. There are 21 maxims of the Jedi and 16 teachings. I thought that was an interesting um, coincidence that there are 16 signs of the adept. They got me started on this whole thing. And there are 16 teachings of the Jedi. I wonder if they line up. So I did put them side by side and they don't line up exactly with the adept, uh, the signs of the adept from the Rosicrucian book. It, 16 is probably just a coincidence, but it's kind of cool to think about. Um, and I won't read all of these precepts and maxims of the Jedi, but I'm sure that unless you've been raised under a rock, you've probably seen at least the first Star Wars movie. You probably have an idea of what the, um, what the Jedi are like. I don't I think I need to go into detail on those. So those are the eight. What makes the Jedi unique? All right. So what makes the Jedi unique? I said harmony because... The Jedi concept of harmony is, is that all this chaos that we see is actually part of the divine plan. And that's, that's a very Christian concept, that God has the ultimate plan. To the Jedi, the Force has the plan. And so, if you're in tune with the Force, then... That is, uh, shows you the way of the grand plan, rebalancing the force. And then the other thing that makes them unique was empathy. Most of the other, the, the Jedi focus on being empathic and, and understanding the other person's position. Um, and they sometimes use that to manipulate, you know, the Jedi mind trick, where they use that to control the feelings of the other person, you know, you know, um, so, but they, they control, manipulate it, but their idea of empathy is kind of unique too. So now for the 12 maxims, and I'll tell you where they came from, but let's go out now to the Cabal Fang Temple and go to the chalkboard and we'll write these things out. All right, so now for the 12 maxims of the spiritual warrior. So again, what I did was I got the 12 most prevalent characteristics or ideals, tenets, um, if you will, of the warriors between all eight. And then what I did was I arrived at a maxim or a, a way of putting it that would be easy to recall. And then I kind of drew on the ones I thought that were the most emblematic of it. So the first one was the most, most prevalent is self-control. And I thought that this was, this was the one that was shared by by most of the of the uh, spiritual warrior types that we that I analyzed, and I thought the Shaolin most exemplified that. And I said the maxim is be relaxed and tranquil even unto death's door. 
The second one is courage. And I thought that the, the samurai most exemplified that as, and, and I took their maxim, every day consider yourself as dead. If you're already dead, then there's nothing to fear. The third most prevalent concept was detachment. Now, detachment and renunciation are two different things. Detachment is emotional detachment, pulling back from your emotions. Renunciation is from the ways of the world or from material possessions. So, detachment. And the maxim I arrived at was, do not display anger or other emotions. Be free of passions, yet full of love. And that I got from the Stoics, because I thought that the Stoic is the most exemplary example of it. So, the fourth, justice. Now this I took directly from the Knights Templar, this uh, the, from the uh, the Latin rule. Everywhere and always be the champion of the right and the good against injustice and evil. The fifth prowess. Just being good at fighting. Aspire to the height of grace and skill in action, voice, and demeanor. And that obviously comes straight out of that quote that I just read of, about the Palatine. Number six. Education. This is actually on the list of 12, halfway up the list of the most prevalent things. This way of the spiritual warrior is also in terms of education. Read with diligence and do not rest satisfied with light and superficial common knowledge. And that comes from the Stoics. Number seven, you probably already noticed this one as I was uh, doing the video that fraternity among brothers and sisters in the martial, uh, spiritual martial traditions is very big. And we got that, uh, I borrowed the maxim from the Huarong. Remain faithful to your friends. You will notice I didn't borrow any maxims from Cabal Fang because, again, that's an existing synthesis that I came up with, and I wanted to bring up some things that I don't want to focus on the things that I created. And I didn't also I didn't also borrow anything from the Jedi because Again, the Jedi are a property that's owned by Disney, and I didn't want to. And in in the in the temple, those those guys over at the temple, the Jedi take that very seriously, and I didn't feel like it was my place to borrow anything from them in terms of maxims. So all these maxims come from the other six uh, uh, spiritual warrior paths. So after fraternity comes indomitability.
And I got this from the Huarong. As the pine scorns frost and snow, stand tall and persevere despite negativity, obstacles, and repeated failures. Nine, integrity. We're big on that in Cabal Fang, to know, to will, to dare, to keep silent, all right? Thinking, speaking, and doing are the same action. That comes directly from the Samurai Code. Thinking, speaking, and doing are the same action. Don't think of speech different than acting. Speech is a movement of the throat muscle the same as your arm is the movement of your arm muscle. You must be united in your thoughts, your desires, your actions, and your beliefs. Number 10. Renunciation. Give no thought to what you will wear, to what you will eat, or where you will sleep. And I got that from the Shaolin, because the Shaolin are mendicants. They, they, uh, they were supposed to travel the world and beg for food and not worry about such things. All the warrior paths, well, four of the eight warrior paths have at least some mention, central mention, of renunciation in the path. Material objects are not what life is about. Number 11. Sacred speech. The sacredness of speech. What you say matters. So, I got this, I borrowed this maxim from the Knight Templar. Every idle word contains a sin. Speak therefore little, and then only in truth, care, and simplicity. And then finally, number 12, Stoicism. Now, you might, might say I might have borrowed a, a, a maxim from the Stoics to use for Stoicism, but I didn't because the most Stoic of them all, of all the warrior paths, was, is the Palatan, of the ones that I, that I analyzed anyway. The Palatans were, none of the other warrior paths were expected to be torturable and not to cry out, when their flesh was being scraped from their very bones. And from them, I took the maxim, never cry out in pain. I'm going to post the 12 maxims on, the, on my website, and they will be um, there if you want to go there and get the 12 maxims. Um, and you should maybe give some thought to living these maxims. Uh, if you're a warrior and you want to be, uh, you want to uh, uh, embody and, and act and live the 12 most common warrior ideals, then this would, might be the way to go. You might consider doing that. Um, I certainly am making, going to make every endeavor to incorporate all of these into my training. Almost all of these are in there already. The one that I think I'm probably most concerned about at this time is probably my renunciation of material objects is a, is a problem for me. I have a lot of possessions and a home, and I've got a wife to care for, and it makes it very difficult to stay away from possessions. 
I also have a tendency to talk too much and run my mouth, which is a problem. And I tend to also be a little bit of a whiny hiney when it comes to complaining and griping and moaning. So I've got some work to do down here uh, in all of the areas, frankly. I think we all, if we're honest, will find that we are far from perfect. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I want to remind you to get dirty. Get dirty in the world. Get dirty in your training. And get dirty in your spirituality. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. Ask yourself if you're living these things. If you're a warrior, if you're a martial artist, are you incorporating these into your training? Thanks for watching. Take care.